Coming up in this edition of Inside Sports, we'll be looking at the development of fencing in Jamaica, and later we explore the factors that have hindered the growth of sports on the island. When we return, the conversation begins. Welcome back to Inside Sports. I'm Nodley Wright. Now, fencing is a group of three combat sports. It has been a part of the Olympics since 1896, and with me to discuss the growth and development of the sport in Jamaica is national coach Kurt Schmick. Kurt, how are you doing? Not too bad, Nodley. Thank you for having me. Wonderful. Uh, Kurt, when we hear about um, fencing in Jamaica, it's, people normally joke about that. So the only fencing we know about is jumping fence or putting up barbed wire or, or zinc fence. But what really is fencing? Uh, fencing is a combative sport which mm -hmm. utilizes swords. As everybody knows, you know, when you think of fencing or think of swords, mm -hmm. um, you think of almost like kids playing with sticks. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of that. Um, it goes back as early as you mentioned in terms of sport, mm -hmm. but earlier on, as far back as the Egyptians, you're seeing depictions of persons fighting with swords. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Egypt. Yes. Uh, where is it credited as being originated? Um, modern fencing, as we mm -hmm. know it, is credited really out of Europe. There are mm -hmm. two or three schools which are known to have started the sport itself, mm -hmm. um, that would be like Italy and France um, and even Hungary with the saber itself. Right, but um, what do you think would have led to the starting of fencing? Was it um, a sport or was it war? Uh, in the initial records which I've, I've seen suggest mm -hmm. that it was you had your, for want of a better word, your upper class persons, mm -hmm. um, kings and kings and princes uh, would be training in swordplay or com well, combat at, at that. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually what happens is that when you don't have wars and you practice all the time, you want it to be competitive with somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of where we see it developing from with those schools and those masters who used to teach those persons creating their own schools. All right, are there different uh, kinds of fencing? Or uh, yes, so fencing, as you mentioned earlier, is divided into three weapons, or mm -hmm. three disciplines therein. Uh, we have the foil, uh, which is the smallest of the weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the epi, which is considered the purest of the weapons. Mm -hmm. And you have the saber, which is considered the fastest of the weapons. Mm -hmm. Do we practice all three here in Jamaica? Uh, yes, we do. Um, typically, a fencer starting out will start with foil. Um, mm -hmm. as it gives you a good basis for all three weapons. Mm -hmm. um, and there, from there you progress and say whether you'd, what you prefer, saber, or whether you prefer epee or to remain in foil. All right, and in terms of what we have here in Jamaica, or even before we get to that, in terms of the different sports, I know I'm not seeing a graphic of it right now, and you said there are three different types. To the layman, how would a layman be able to identify the, the three different aspects of it? Um, when you're watching foil, um, well, to look at a foil, you see you'll, you have to compare. I, ideally, you'd want to look at all three. Mm -hmm. um, the foil itself is a point-based weapon, mm -hmm. meaning that you must touch your opponent with the point of the weapon itself. Mm -hmm. um, foil use, utilizes primarily the torso and the lower part of the neck as mm -hmm. target area. Um, if you're looking at the epee, now it's a much heavier, it's much heavier weapon than the the foil itself. Mm -hmm. um, it's bigger, uh, heavier, heavier piece of steel therein. Um, and 
as I said before, it's considered the purest form because the target area in that is anything that lies between your, the top of your head and your toe. A question which comes to mind readily. Can one get hurt uh, participating in, in this sport because there are weapons involved? Um, certainly, as with any other sport, injury can take place. Mm -hmm. um, primarily, the, most of the injuries that we see is, is related to just being hit extra hard or um, in some instances, if your footwork is not up to, up to standard, you mm -hmm. can pull a muscle therein. And speaking of that, how much does fitness play a part in your execution? Um, fitness plays a very strong part in the, in the, in the whole execution process. Mm -hmm. uh, a fencer is, a fencing match is about two minutes. Uh, so typically how, we, how you look at it is, it's, you have two minutes to, to, to complete, to, to score five, five points, mm -hmm. five touches as we call it. Um, and within that time, you're pretty much moving as fast as you can um, to either avoid a hit or to, to make a hit or touch. So it's pretty explosive then. Yes. But uh, in terms of the protection, is that very heavy? Does it weigh down the competitor? Initially, when you first put on a jacket, and mm -hmm. the, the response from everybody is, boy, this is, this is heavy and a lot. But once you start moving, you don't really notice it. All right. And in terms of the different weapons that you have, does that affect how the, the speed at which one moves in order to compete? Um, yes, it does. Usually with an epi, for instance, because the target area is so broad, mm -hmm. um, you're a lot more cautious in terms of going into an, going into an attack. Um, because just as you're going in, you can be hit just as well. Uh, FA itself doesn't utilize what we call priority. Right. So in that sense, it's a very more, more careful sport. When you look at something like Sabre, um, which doesn't utilize an off-target, but is as considered a slashing weapon, um, it's twice as fast as what, I would, what we consider, um, as both, both opponents are, are vying for that priority, mm -hmm. meaning you've started your attack before the other person. So usually when people watch a saber match, it's a lot of just almost looks like two, two rams butting, butting heads, mm -hmm. so to speak, as everybody's going for that first point and first touch. All right. How lucrative a sport is this, or is it just some people would consider this idle pursuit? Um, so for somebody starting out in fencing, mm -hmm. um, someone who, who is not necessarily at a university level. Mm -hmm. um, you do have scholarships for fencers. Mm -hmm. um, we have a fencer that's currently at Ohio State that is with the national, that is now a part of our national squad. Um, and he competes competitive, competitively at the NCAA level. Mm -hmm. um, from that perspective, you do have the, um, not the grants, scholarships and so on. Um, above that level, you'll find that there's certain sponsorship deals um, at the, at the, that's at the top, top levels. Um, some of our athletes are sponsored, some not of our athletes, other athletes I know of are sponsored by companies like Red Bull or like a 3M um, for European fencers. So it's not easy then for one to make a living from this sport? Not easy, no. Not yet, okay. Not yet. All right, because um, just like with mixed martial arts and stuff, when that started out, it wasn't a big money thing. So You're right. Hopefully, maybe. All right, looking at Jamaica now, at what age do you get people involved in the sport? Uh, typically, we like to start as early as eight, seven or eight. Mm -hmm. um, primarily because at the level of at the international level when it comes to competition, where there are three classes, well, three primary classes that we look at, and that's the cadet, the junior, and the senior level, um, which those levels start um, or change roughly at about 15, 18, and on to 40. All right, this question has to come. In terms of the, you look at the, the gender ratio, are there more males involved than females? Uh, locally, you will find more males. Um, you know, it's one of the things in Jamaica we say, you know, you have a girl child and a girl child picnic, you want to protect them. Mm -hmm. um, but for the females that do come in, uh, you find that they're more aggressive than males okay. in the sport. But is it, does what we have here in Jamaica, is it the same the world over where you have less women than men? Um, that's a very good question. I've seen outside mm -hmm. of Jamaica, I find it to be a little bit more balanced. Okay. Um, 
I think it's just a, it's a, a thing where expose, exposure of your children um, to different sports and so on. And, and usually when you think of fencing, a lot of, a lot of people shy away because they think it's a violent sport when it's really not. Um, and from that perspective, I find that in Jamaica we're probably not exposing our children as much. All right. Uh, people with disabilities, is there a place for them in the sport? And do you encourage that locally? Um, certainly there is. Um, there is where fencing is a part, well, wheelchair fencing is a part of the Paralympics as well. Mm -hmm. um, we were working with some athletes locally um, to get there, to get to that level. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID um, and other circumstances, we weren't able to make it this year in that respect. All right, speaking of COVID, how has that affected your plans to grow the sport locally and to be active? Um, COVID came as a, I would say, a big hit to, to us here. Um, as it relates to sport, a lot of sports, a lot of sporting activities came to a complete halt. Um, whereas we were in several schools across Kingston, um, that came to an abrupt halt as students were no longer going to schools. Um, schools were effectively shut down and, school, mm -hmm. and once school resumed, they resumed the online, um, leaving little space for sporting activities at the time. Um, we've since adapted, as mm -hmm. everybody says, the key word last year I think was pivoted, pivoted. Mm -hmm. and um, as it relates to fencing, we started doing more classes and using, using spaces that were previously not available to us trying to utilize those in larger spaces that would allow for better social distancing. Are there any plans to take part in any competitions for the rest of the year? Um, for the rest of the year, yes. We're looking at the Panam, Panam, Panam competition, mm -hmm. which should be hosted, I believe, in Colombia this year. When? Um, down in October, I believe. Okay. Now, Kurt, why do you keep these things a secret? <laughs> Well, there's, always, there's usually qualifiers and stuff which those are yet to be decided on. Um, one of the down, what definitely one of the downfalls with COVID is that competitions internationally came to an abrupt halt as well. And one of the issues that you still have now is that a lot of countries are wary of travelers coming in mm -hmm. and hosting competitions where we've had several competitions on our calendar just being canceled and wiped off. Okay. Well, Kurt, uh, thank you very much. We'll be paying close attention to the sport and the progress of all involved. We're going to take a break now. Thank you very much for thank you. being with us. When we return, we'll be focusing on the development of sports post-COVID-19 at the collegiate level. We'll be talking with the Director of Sports at the University of Technology Jamaica, Orville Byfield. Individual athletes to entire sports leagues, the sports industry has been among those significantly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome back to Inside Sports. I'm not the right. With me to discuss the impact of the pandemic at the collegiate level is Director of Sports at the University of Technology Jamaica, Mr. Orville Byfield. Orville, welcome. Thank you for having me here, Mr. Wright. Recruitment is <coughs> a major thing at colleges locally and internationally and institutions such as UTEC, how do you manage the recruiting process? Well, in terms of recruitment, um, mm -hmm. first of all, the coaches would have to identify the athletes mm -hmm. and then from there, the athlete's name would be submitted to a committee and then the committee would now look at, at the qualification of the athletes Mm -hmm. and to ensure that they meet the, the necessary requirements to, to enter in the university. From there, we will process the, the students and they would be a part of the university. But certainly, academics must be a part of that. Yes, academic is a must. So they must acquire the necessary um, subjects for the specific area of study that they are going in. Once they have met those requirements, mm -hmm. then the process starts from there. But last year into this year, 
different times, no activity. How did that affect the whole recruiting process? Well, that's affected our recruitment process significantly because you know that the pandemic was here and based off... Was or is? No, is here. Okay. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, was here. I mean, um, it really <clears throat> put a lot of pressure on us mm -hmm. in terms of we have athletes out there who, who, who have finished their final year at, at Boys and Girls Championship mm -hmm. who, who are really looking forward to move on to the next level. And it was heart bubbling for us not to accept some of them based on the, the pandemic and the seriousness of the pandemic. I know that we alone weren't in the same boat in terms mm -hmm. of other schools internationally who did not accept some of them. So, I mean, now we are trying, seeing that the government is now kind of opening up. Mm -hmm. Most of most of the day, the scholarships would come from football and track and field. So, for the high schools, yeah? So now we are going to be looking at how we can find a way based on what is going on now. I know that everybody is taking vaccination and all these things. So, we are going to be seeing how best we can facilitate as they go along. We're, we're not sure about how we are going to go about this, but as soon as things get a little bit closer to normality, All right. then we'll see. I hear that, Orville, and you did a very nice job dancing around. But give me some, <laughs> some numbers now. How many athletes would you normally, if you just give me two, two sports basically, uh, track and field, which is a major sport at yes. UTEC and maybe football, how many would have been admitted in under normal circumstances, normal times, and how many were admitted last year? And you may want to give me some figures well, relating well, to that as well, well. Normally, we would have from the track and field side, mm -hmm. from anywhere between eight to 16 athletes at any one time. Mm -hmm. The other sports we normally would have two from each each of the other sports that normally comes in. So in terms of normality, mm -hmm. this is what we, we, we would normally have. But since the pandemic we had no 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 athletes came in during that time. I know this is at a significant cost to the university. Mm -hmm. Those students who were already in and not competing, how did you manage that process? Were well, they retained and the university still pay for them? Yes, I mean, we, we are committed to our athletes at UTEC. Mm -hmm. they, they, had, they have signed a contract with us mm -hmm. in terms of the sports and the academics so they need to to have a 2.0 mm -hmm. and also to attend their training session and to compete so they would have complied now with the pandemic we would have we we took a decision in terms of all right this is a pandemic period we don't have competitions at this point in time so let, let us look at their their academics in terms of keeping that 2.0 and once they're above the 2.0 we would we would be committed to facilitate them with their academics during this period so that they could continue with the academic side of of their okay. their education are you in a position to assess the the academic performances of the athletes and to decide whether or not them being out of competition was, a, was positive for them? Yes, I mean, a lot of them had more time to focus on studies because now they weren't competing. So they were focusing on their studies. So their grades have actually improved a lot. So we have divided it into three sections. So mm -hmm. we have quarter scholarship, we had the half, and we have a full scholarship. So they, they would have to be within within a particular grade range, mm -hmm. but most of them got some support from the Department of Sports. I can't let you escape. Yes. With the fact that they have done better 
with no competition. How does this inform the way how you go um, go forward in terms of maintaining student athletes and having them balance the academic and the athletic aspect of their school life? Okay, one of the one of the the things when I just <coughs> came mm -hmm. as the the director of sports. Mm -hmm. We put in some programs where we had a study area mm -hmm. for them. We tried to improve their lives as students, not only as as sport athletes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we want to have a rounded student athletes who, after four years, they would have their their degree mm -hmm. and they would compete to the best of their their ability because. When you look at sports, it's not everybody is going to become the, the, the next Usain Bolt or the next Shelley and Fraser. So they have to look at sports and their education as a way. So if they don't make it in sports to the elite level, they still have something to fall on. So right. the education is that base in which they would fall back on. Orville, most people who look at intercollegiate sports uh, internationally, they have the American example to go by, the NCAAs. Here in Jamaica, we have the, the Intercol, and I know you are aware of them. How do you measure how the NCAAs function as opposed to the Intercol here? In well, Jamaica. So, so the NCAA, which is the National Collegiate Athletic Association, mm -hmm. they have three divisions in which they, they compete, or mm -hmm. they would call them conferences. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> at Division 3, they don't do scholarships. Mm -hmm. But in Division 2 and 1, that, that's where they would do the scholarships. But the, the thing about comparing intercal with the NCAA is that intercal we mix the university, the colleges, and the 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 com colleges mm -hmm. into one. But in the NCAAs, you have to do it's a four year program. Mm -hmm. The education is the same, but the division is different. Mm -hmm. With intercal. We, we only have about four universities, and then we have the colleges, and then we have the com colleges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So <clears throat> most of these colleges would do you would do two years, and then the last two years you have to find a college, or, or there's a collaboration between both. But we don't have a lot of universities like these countries, mm -hmm. especially the United States. So we merged everybody, but. One of the things that we want to actually do is that Intercol don't have the type of funding and we are depending on corporate Jamaica to sponsor us for everything. What I think is that we have 23 universities, colleges or com colleges mm -hmm. within the intercollegiate structure. I think that every school or every university or every member of Intercol, mm -hmm. these schools, should, should make a donation of half a million or a million to, to have some pool and then to invest it with a Mayberry or Barita Money Market or JMB so that Intercol can have the type of resources outside of speaking to corporate Jamaica in terms of managing the referees for matches mm -hmm. to really run the to really run intercal on a very organized level because right now because of the lack of funding intercal has not gone to, to the level like a boys and girls championship where Everything is sorted out, which is a grassroots, mm -hmm. which, we, which is good. We have a good base, but we need to put the roof on the house. And I think that intercal is where the roof should should go on because we have a lot of talent. But you take alone can't hold all of the athletes that we have out there right now, nor UWI. But the other universe, the other colleges, they don't have the type of resources also to do that and I think that we would see better athletes cutting out of Jamaica 
one of the other points also is that when our athletes, for example, the track and field athletes, go overseas, they have to work on a double periodization system mm -hmm. where they compete indoors and they compete outdoor. Sad to say, the coaches are not really interested in the, in the national outcome. Mm -hmm. The coaches are mostly concerned with their jobs and the division that they are in and they have to win these conferences. So I think that the athletes have to work very hard away from when they are here. It's a singular periodization. So we don't have an indoor and our outdoor. We just have an outdoor setting and the athletes get a little bit more time. But the only thing that, that is lacking here is that mm -hmm. we don't have the type of resources. And that's where I want to come back to you, Orville, because you, you spoke about the institutions giving up maybe half a million or so, getting that into a fund. But the universities themselves are struggling to get funding. Why is it that in, um, businesses more readily invest in high school sports, as with ISA, when high school sport doesn't give the country the kind of recognition that tertiary level and those fresh out of tertiary institutions do? And how do we fix that? How do we make it more appealing to them? All right, we keep saying that sports is a multi-billion dollar business or a trillion dollar business. But I don't think that we are really packaging sport the way how we should package it. Because I'm saying that at the tertiary level, that's where you will make the most money. Mm -hmm. But I see where we have just hold on to the grassroots, which mm -hmm. is good. But now we have to, to think about getting our athletes to compete at a higher level where they can earn. And once our athletes are earning, it means that the country is also earning because when they, when they earn big, they spend here. So I think that that's the, the direction that we should go. We don't have oil here. Our, our resources lies within our people. And I'm saying that sports is a very big market for us. Thank you very much, Orville, for all that you have provided. It's a lot of food for thought, and it's something that we have to consider as a country if we are going to make the best of what you consider to be our greatest resource, our people. That's all the time that we have for this episode. We want to thank Mr. Orville Byfield, Director of Sports at the University of Technology, Jamaica, and the National Coach of Jamaica's Fencing Federation, Kurt Schmick, who was with us earlier. I am Nodley Wright. Thanks for watching.